Hi, welcome to tonight's Town Talk. I'm City Manager Scott Neal. This year we planned a series of Town Talks around topics important to Edina residents. Tonight's presentation is about affordable housing. Affordable housing development manager Stephanie Hawkinson will define affordable housing, explain why housing affordability is at risk in Edina, and the role of government in communities' affordable uh, housing and what the city of Edina has done in recent years. Stephanie will speak for about 30 minutes. After her presentation, she will take questions. Those who would like to ask questions from home can call toll-free at 866-571-0905. At with conference pin 2472623. Press star 1 on your telephone keypad when you are ready to ask a question during, the, during that part of the event. An operator will mute your line and place you in the queue until it is your turn to speak. We will end tonight's town talk when there are no more questions or 8, or 8 p.m., whichever is first. However, you can continue to ask questions and make comments online at bettertogetheredina.org for the next week. The online conversation closes on Thursday, February 29th. Now I would like to formally introduce Stephanie. Stephanie Hawkinson has served as the Affordable Housing Development Manager for the City of Edina for more than five years. She brings knowledge of both the developer and the public funding procedures uh, to process her work. Her extensive development skills are, were acquired in part through an 11-year tenure with the City of St. Paul as a Senior Project Manager in the Department of Planning and Economic, Economic Development, and six and a half years as the Director of Housing Development with the Landon Group, a private consulting firm. Building on her public sector capacity, Steph Stephanie's consultant work teamed her with both nonprofit and for-profit clients on complex financial portfolios. Stephanie understands all the steps of the development process, including feasibility analysis, financial modeling, site selection and acquisition, pre-development funding, assembling a development team, securing financing and shepherding developments through closing and construction. She excels at project management, as well as bringing project partners and stakeholders together to work efficiently and transparently. Her highly efficient working style and dedication to affordable housing make Stephanie an integral part of any development team. Please uh, welcome Stephanie Hawkinson. Stephanie. Thank you very much. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, so why are we discussing affordable housing? Why has there been all this conversation regarding affordable housing? Let's start with housing in Edina right now and compare it to what it's been like in the past. The green line at the top represents houses with a price point of $300,000 to $490,000. As you can see to the left of the graph, that was 2014, and the right of the graph is 2023. And 2021, it's the number of homes in that price range has fallen from 45% of the housing stock to about 15% of the housing stock. The bottom line, which is a darker green, and you can't really tell from the slide, but in 2014, it represented its home values of under $300,000. And in 2014, it represented about 15% of the housing stock, and those houses are virtually gone right now. Conversely, the golden line are homes that are valued greater than a million dollars. And in 2014, there are fewer than 10% of the housing stock were those homes. Now, they represent about 25% of the housing stock. Based on the history, oops, excuse me. Let me go back a little bit. So you can see in 2021, there was kind of a shift where the homes, the luxury homes have increased dramatically, the, um, the proportion of them, where homes that are in the moderate range have fallen off. Here's another way of showing that. In 2020, or excuse me, year 2000, the average, the median estimated market value was about 200,000, a little over 200,000. It is estimated that in 10 years from now, or 2030, that the median housing value in Edina is gonna be about 1.2 million. 
Now, this is great for people that live in their homes and want to stay and remain in Edina. I mean, they will benefit, you all will benefit from increase in equity. However, it does pose a challenge for homeowners who want to either downsize to a smaller home, for families that grew up here and are starting their own families and want to move back, or for people who work in Edina and want to reduce their commute by living near their job. The similar graphs are available for people who rent, and there are and have always been a lot of renters in Edina. The gap between the incomes and rent and the growth rates of each has dramatically widened. In 2020, um, 2022, the rents, the rents have tripled the value versus relative to incomes. It is becoming harder and harder to afford even rental property in Edina. This radically impacts housing security and stability. It has been shown that housing and security can have a negative impact on health, educational outcomes, and work productivity. Here's a graph that talks about housing cost burden. The, and the housing cost burden is when a household spends more than 30% of their income on their housing costs. Although there's always been a percentage of folks that have experienced housing cost burden, based on the most recent census data, 49% of renters in Edina are facing housing cost burden, and 21% of homeowners are cost burden. There's research that I'm not going to go into tonight due to lack of time that shows the negative impacts of children in cost burden households on their education and health. This also affects the local economy because if people are spending a vast majority of their income on their housing costs, they are not spending it in the local economy. So in 20, or year 2000, so 24 years ago, the people that worked in the big growth industries in Edina were able to purchase a home in the city. These include public workers, elementary and secondary school teachers, and even to a certain extent, people in leisure and hospitality fields. In the, on the line on the right, or the points on the right, is 2021. So 20 years later, the median cost of homes has vastly outpaced incomes. So what this basically means is a child that grew up in Edina who could be in the same field their parent was when their parent moved to Edina 20 years later could not afford a home here. So what does affordable mean? There's a misconception that affordable housing is for people who are chronically unemployed. That is simply not true. This graph is um, used often for rental housing. It, we talk about 30%, 50%, and 60% of area median income. This is area median income for the area, for Hennepin County, and these numbers are given to us by the federal government. So for example, a 60% household with four people, their income could be $74,520, and rent, at that level for a two bedroom apartment could be $1,677. On the other side, for a 30% median income, the incomes range from 26,000 for a single person household to 37,000 for a four person household. And rent limits at that, for that level range between 652 for a studio and 838 for a two bedroom. At these higher ends, these are not overly dissimilar to what some people are paying in their mortgage cost if they've lived in their home for a few years. Who are we talking about? We're talking about wait staff, cashier, child care workers, janitors, cleaners, preschool teachers, substitute teachers, security guards, cooks. We're talking about people that help make Edina run and who work here, where a lot of jobs are in the city. And these are the folks, and these are the incomes, and these income levels came from DEED. And this is assuming a 40-hour work week. These are the folks that would benefit greatly from affordable housing. So in addition to what I've said, 
What are the benefits to us? What is the benefit to the city for creating affordable housing? I'll start with a quote. Stable and affordable housing is the foundation for business and economic growth, as well as a host of other positive individual and systemic outcomes. Increasing housing production and improving housing affordability will benefit families, firms, and the entire Minneapolis-St. Paul region for generations to come. I mentioned this of how affordable housing can address the needs of existing Edina residents. It can provide opportunities for children who grew up here to return to raise their own families. It can provide a place when a household wants to downsize to a smaller home. And it eases the cost burden households so they can spend more of their income in the local, helping the local economy. What is the return? What is the return on investment for providing affordable housing to this community? It increases the property taxes on redevelopment parcels. It allows cost burden houses, as I said before, to spend more of their income to help the local economy and local businesses. It decreases traffic congestion and time spent on the roads when people can live closer to their jobs. It actually increases Edina-based school children. Currently, 20% of the um, Edina students are open enrolled from outside Edina. Affordable housing also reduces emergency room visits, hospital admissions and inpatient days, resulting in large decreases in our health care costs. And I don't know you, about you all, but I know that the premium on my health insurance increases every year. The city's efforts and interest in increasing the availability of affordable housing is not just based on data and numbers. It is also in response to Edina residents' requests. Every two years is a quality of life survey of Edina residents. Consistently, over the last several surveys, residents stated that more affordable housing is needed. That the current and changing housing stock is not reflective of what is needed in the community. Specifically, in the last survey, over 60% of respondents said that there is too little to far too little housing for lower income individuals and families. These are respondents of Edina residents. Residents input was also incorporated in drafting the comprehensive plan, which in whole and in parts was reviewed and discussed at over 180 public meetings. Contained within is the goal of 1,804 new affordable housing units. The creation of this document took three years, which followed a couple of years of meetings and community surveys called Vision Edina and the Big Ideas Workshops. The comprehensive plan is not prescriptive, but provides guidelines where multifamily housing could be located, preserves existing single family neighborhoods, and calls for additional mid sized missing middle housing. As the comprehensive plan was working its way through the approval process, the City Council created the Edina resident based task force to focus specifically on housing. The task force was selected from 50 applicants to provide a broad spectrum of opinions. They met 45 times in public meetings to develop strategies for implementing a common vision on housing. Prior to HRA and City Council adoption, the plan was reviewed by the Human Rights and Relations Commission and the Edina Housing Foundation. Both groups comprised of Edina residents. The, their feedback was shared with the HRA and the City Council. The City's housing plans are also informed by the Climate Action Plan, which was adopted by a team of 26 members and includes input from 449 Edina residents. The Climate Action Plan calls for increasing housing density. As stated in the plan, they want to increase the average population per developed acre by 40%. 4% by 2030. We want to preserve and enhance affordable housing near bus service to protect vulnerable populations and allow and encourage the construction of ADUs. Finally, the city's housing programs and policies are informed by the resident-led race and equity implementation report. This task force, this was created by a task force that met for 18 months, was comprised of eight core community members and incorporated 200 community comments. The report highlighted that the vast majority of affordable housing 
is in the Southdale area, and that is also the quadrant with the greatest diversity. For equity and inclusion goals, the HRA has supported affordable developments throughout the city through various programs. Okay, so now we have an understanding of why we're looking at affordable housing, how Edina could benefit from the creation of more affordable housing, but what is the role of government? Why is affordable housing not just happening organically in the marketplace? One major reason is financing. It costs a lot more to construct than what either a renter or a homeowner could pay to live there. To understand affordable housing, I need to briefly discuss financing. I know this is a very dry topic for some people, but it's pretty critical to affordable housing. As mentioned, the comprehensive plan together with other plans guide my work. Within the, is the goal, as I stated, to create 1,804 new affordable units and to increase density as well as sustainable building practices. An added benefit is increased tax base when a site is redeveloped. But the city is not a residential developer. Therefore, we rely on professional developers to help us fulfill our goals. This does not mean we cater to their demands, but we work with them collaboratively and negotiate to make sure that both theirs and our goals are met. So to create affordable housing and market rate can cost, especially in apartments, relatively the same. There are fixed costs. You know, you have acquisition costs, you have rehab and construction costs, you have third party reports, you have professional fees, legal architecture, and you have financing fees. So with market rate developments, you can adjust rents and in Edina, the market rents tend to be a little higher and that can help cover a lot of the costs to develop the market rate housing unless there are extraordinary circumstances. With affordable housing, since the rents are low, they're maxed per that graph I showed earlier, the debt financing, the amount that the rent can leverage in mortgage financing to the developer is only about 25 to 60% of the overall cost to develop. So here's a slide with a lot of numbers, but in it's very high level and very abbreviated, but it would, it's just to show you the difference between market rate and affordable. So with market rate, you get your rent income based on the market. With affordable, you have these, these regulated suppressed rents. With operating expenses, pretty much the same with these two buildings. You have your um, leasing agent, you have your maintenance crews, you have um, grounds, you have utilities, taxes. So, but and if you take your income minus your expenses, you have your net operating income. And that is what you use to size mortgage debt, how much you can borrow from a bank. So with the market rate, since they have a higher NOI, they can have a more mortgage. They can borrow a lot more money. With affordable, the, as you can see in the difference, you could borrow a lot less money. Now, both types have an equity investor. With market rate, it's Investors that expect a return on their investment, they look at the stock market and they look at different ways where they can invest their money and get a return, and housing being one of them. With um, affordable projects, you look at tax credit investors. These are folks that um, invest money in affordable housing in exchange for a tax break. Now the difference in this example is that there's still a gap. There's still short funds in order to do, build the building. And in this example, it's close to $7 million. That's gap. So if the, same, the cost's about the same to build, market rate or affordable, and now you have a gap with affordable, where, how are you gonna fill that gap? Cities do not have the financial capacity to fill this gap on their own. In that slide, it showed $7 million that was needed. We have not given $7 million to an affordable housing project. So we rely on our public partners. We, there was a sketch plan last night, and that project, as 100% affordable, had a $30 million gap. Not seven, as in the example, but $30 million. And that is not atypical. That is pretty standard for an affordable housing deal. Therefore, multiple sources of financing must be secured to make affordable housing happen. 
The most likely sources come from Minnesota Housing, Hennepin County, and the Met Council, and these are highly competitive. Multiple cities, developments in cities around, all around, and multiple within a city, if you're a larger city, are applying for these sources of financing, which is limited. Now cities, in Edina, we have used TIF. We could use tax abatement, although we haven't. We have pool TIF. We have our affordable housing trust fund, and we could use regulatory incentives like SACWAC, um, to the sewer and water connections. Some cities use also HRA levy. They have uh, larger revolving loan funds, or they use public bonding. We do not do that here. So our funding partners also have goals and uh, um, objectives that don't always align with the city goals. But if we are going to access their money because we can't support a $30 million gap, and therefore we need our funding partners to try to make these projects a reality, the project needs to align with their goals and objectives. Some of them are aligned with ours, um, like wanting a minimum impact on the climate. Others may vary. Minnesota Housing, for example, they prioritize family housing over senior housing. They also say that they have to have large bedrooms. They need to have 75% of the units have to have two or more bedrooms, and of that 75%, 75% of that have to have three and four bedrooms. They also require very, very low income tenants. Often these come from coordinated entry, have experienced homelessness, or have a disability. Now, for some, that may be a human rights issues. For others, that may be worrisome and alarming. But in order to be competitive, in order to capture any of that other money, those rules must be followed. We cannot finance a big project or even a medium-sized project on our own. Here's an example of an affordable housing project that was built in Edina. The light blue is tax credit equity from um, investors who can invest anywhere. They can invest in Dinah, they can invest in Florida, they can invest anywhere. The first mortgage is the dark blue, which is clearly a minority of the financing sources. The city is the red. We provided a loan, a deferred loan that will get paid back. The state provided money, the county provided money, and we had TIF. So there's multiple sources. I worked on a project once that had well over 12 sources of financing. So what have we done? We now know that cities involved in creating affordable housing, that it's needed, that it benefits us. So what have we done towards this objective? We have had policy initiatives. We have you hired a housing person. Uh, we approved a fair housing policy. We have, a, for the first time, proactively acquired land to, for the use of affordable housing. We adopted affordable housing trust fund ordinance. We approved rental licensing. We have a tenant protection ordinance. We approved a housing improvement area to help condo associations. And this year, um, you, the city council will be reviewing the possibility of an accessory dwelling unit ordinance. What have we also done? We have preserved affordable ownership. Between 2010 and 2022, over 1,000 single family homes were torn down and rebuilt with luxury homes. The average cost of the homes that were torn down was a little over 400,000. The average cost of the rebuilds was over 1.3 million. So we said, okay, some people don't want their homes torn down. They, some people are fine with it, that's fine. Some people want, they raise their families, they have an emotional connection to their home, they want another family to move there. They can sell their home to one of our funding partners. Homes Within Reach, Habitat for Humanity, or Metro HRA. Since this started, we have acquired 21 homes through this program. So we have been doing some of this housing preservation to put in an affordable housing land trust since 2007, but it was in fits and bursts, one or two homes a year. In 2020, we allocated some of our affordable housing trust fund money, and therefore we were able to really have this program take off, and we have now preserved overall 28 homes. Who's living in these homes? We, um, and this is based on the information that I have about the buyers. We have a registered nurse. We have a special ed teacher. We have administrative assistant, a family advocate, a lead mechanic, utility locator, and many other people that have been able to make Edina 
home because of this program. We also have a home rehab program. And we've had one for a while with the county, but again, only a couple homes were able to be done a year. This allows homeowners, any diner who are income eligible, to borrow up to $30,000 to do um, rehab on their home. In 2021, we, you can see there's a big growth. Again, um, the HRA approved uh, affordable housing trust fund money to be used for this purpose, and people reacted. They responded. We closed 22 loans within the first two years of this program. It slowed down in 2023, but we anticipate it will pick up again in 2024. We have also created affordable housing in multifamily rental properties. The green on this graph are market rate projects that include, through our affordable housing policy, affordable units. The blue are 100% affordable housing. There are only two projects on this map that are west of Highway 100. That would be Avador and Amundsen Flats. Most of these occur in the Southdale area, but this program has allowed us to create, the policy has allowed us to create many more affordable units. We also have a partnership with the Edina Housing Foundation. They provide down payment assistance loans that just help borrowers who want to buy a home in Edina to borrow a little less from their bank. We will lend up, the Edina Housing Foundation will lend up to um, $90,000 as a second mortgage for income qualified buyers that buy a home that is up to $515,000. Since this program started in 2007, 159 households have been aided and over $7.7 .7 million has been lent out. Now these homes do not have a requirement to remain affordable. When the, um, the homeowner sells, they pay back their loan and they, it can be sold for whatever the market will bear. Recently, we approved a first generation home buying program where we lend up to $20,000 in addition to that up to 90 for folks that did not grow up in a home that was owned by their parent or guardian. And this loan is forgiven $1,000 a year for up to 20 years. So where do we go from here? What's next? We have some challenges. We have some pretty big challenges on moving the dial on affordable housing. 93% of residential land use is for single family. You can see on the map all that yellow, that's single family zoning. And so only single family homes can go there. The remaining 7% has competing interests. The pink is commercial residential. So it can be used for commercial activity or multifamily residential activity. So 7% of the land, the, those two competing interests are fighting over the use of that land. Now, in some cases, they can be combined. You could have a mixed use. But with affordable housing, because you have a tax credit investor, they want nothing to do with commercial development. So they will only, for the most part, there are rare situations where this is different, invest in 100% residential housing. Now these investors don't have to invest in Edina. They can invest anywhere in the world. But if they want to invest in Edina, to make it so they want to be here, we can't create roadblocks for them to do so. So the pink, which you can see a lot in the Southdale area and a small area on the west on 169, those can be commercial or residential. We also have a funding issue. Uh, we currently have about a little two, less than $2.5 million remaining to do affordable housing work. We have $600,000 remaining in our Southdale 2 TIF pooled funds. We have $1.8 million, 1 yeah, $1 million in our affordable housing trust fund, and we're growing a new pooled fund from the Amundsen Flats project. So $2.5 million we could preserve through our affordable preservation ownership program about eight homes, or we can provide nominal seed money to a multifamily affordable rental project. So what should be our focus? Should we focus on single family homes? There's a high gap per unit, but um, 
it, that's where most of the residential use is zoned for. Should we focus on duplexes and missing middle? There's broad support for that. We have an issue with zoning where there's not many places where that could go. Or multifamily, it's a very efficient way of using funds, but there's also limited land and zoning. And there's a, getting to be a little bit more pushback on that. Do we preserve our existing affordable, our NOAA, or do we build new construction? Do we have rental or ownership? Where should our attention be? And with that, I am open to questions. Thank you, Thank you Stephanie, for that fascinating presentation. It's now time for questions, and Stephanie will stand for questions. Uh, if you have a question, please call toll-free 866-571-0905 with conference pin 247 Two six two three. Press the star one on your telephone keypad when you are ready to ask a question during that part of the event. An operator will mute your line and place you in the queue until it's your turn to speak. And we will take questions until 8 p.m. or whenever we run out of questions, whichever comes first. Operator, will you please unmute the line of our first caller? And caller, please begin by stating your full name and address for the record. Hello, uh, Andy Brown, 5512 Park Place in Edina. I actually have four questions. Um, one involves the lack of interest rate analysis over the last 20 years by staff. I have a degree in economics from the University of St. Thomas. There is a positive correlation between home values increasing and interest rates being at an all-time generational and lifetime low. So the dollars by which we're looking at what the average home price went up to uh, doesn't seem to uh, make sense to me regarding that not being in the charts. Um, number two, um, the school district is short $3.7 million. Uh, my son is gonna lose bus service and nursing service at Concord Elementary. And it seems to me that we've tipped a lot of property. And I look at that Perkins site, and that's a major case right there. Um, I really do wish that, that we would um, really look at the impacts of what it's gonna have on, on families, existing families, and existing uh, families in the, the school district. Because uh, I think there's been a negative impact there regarding all this. Um, transportation, my third question. Um, Edina has been traditionally a transportation black hole, um, and it got worse after COVID, and that bus service has not returned. Um, there's no passenger rail service on the Dan Patch. Um, you look at where the affordable housing has been going, it has been going to those locations on Southwest Light Rail, and I don't think they need to make the same kind of financial commitments as a city as what has happened in Hopkins and Minnetonka, et cetera. Um, and then fourthly, I just don't understand how it is affordable and equitable given the number of tax increases um, the city has passed over the last 10 years to seniors and to uh, uh, families with young children in the school district. Um, I understand there's a desire to have different housing options for different economies of scale, uh, but um, it's unfair to treat the existing um, taxpayers um, to this level of tax increase and not expect us to just eventually leave, especially if my kid's schooling is going to get cut. Uh, I have no problem in taking him to Breck and moving out of Edina. So I hope you can address those, those concerns and those questions. Thank you. I will do my best in answering the ones I can. I didn't hear any questions. Oh. Uh, I heard four statements, but do you want to well, comment on Well, you know, with, with, the, with the housing market, I put that slide back up. These are basically, you're right, these are the cost, not including the interest rate, of the homes, the median, average median market value of the homes. When interest rates go up, it actually makes it so a person or a household can buy less home. So the, the base cost of a home 
that a household could afford is less as interest rates go up. So the interest rates go up are actually having an effect that of making Edina even less affordable for moderate income homeowners. So if I added that slide, um, and it's, it's a good point, Edina is becoming more out of reach for your average income earner. Um, I know I, we talk about um, health aid workers, government employees, and teachers, um, and their incomes are not increasing to make up for increased interest rates. So it does have an effect, and it just makes it houses more expensive. Um, with regard, I can't make a comment with regards to Dan Patch, and I can't, and I do know that you're right, along light rail, um, a lot of housing is going up um, where their light rail is being put in, and it's not being slated for Edina. Um, there, I, there was some, a question about your school losing money, and I can't speak to that. I can't speak to that either. I, I know that uh, the city's use of tax increment financing, uh, there's no evidence to suggest that that's connected to the current uh, fiscal challenges that the school is facing. Uh, we are going to have a discussion with the school uh, board about that on Friday, actually. So it'll be one of the subjects we take on with them. And uh, at one point that was brought up too, redevelopment, um, all of the redevelopment, has actually increased the value of the property that it's replacing. So the tax, um, it should ha it actually has a helpful effect on the homeowner tax base because it's bringing more money in. It's just the mill rate and everything else that I, that's out of my league to speak on has changed. Jim? All right, operator, will you please unmute the line of our next caller? And caller, as a reminder, please start by stating your full name and address for the record. Yes, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, uh, name's Phil Manti, uh, 5712 Camelback Drive. Um, thank you, first of all, just for taking the time to, um, to take questions. I think it's fantastic that we're using forums to communicate with, uh, you know, families and people in the area. I think it's, I think it's great. So just wanted to um, share my appreciation for that. Um, the, the first thing I just wanted to ask about is, is more just on the implementation side of, of uh, affordable housing. And I want to use the, just the example of, of Amundsen Flats, um, as kind of a, a case study. Um, yeah, it was built, I think in 2019, 62-unit uh, affordable housing complex in Cahill, and th there's just been a lot of, uh, of incidents around there recently. You guys probably saw six days ago, there was the, um, the assault there, I think it was eight days ago, there was an assault there. Um, just tons of resident complaints about uh, drug use, about um, you know, harassment of local businesses, break-ins. Um, one resident said it looked like a hurricane went through there because um, all the windows have been busted out. I, I just, I think the sort of the, the characterization that, you know, this is all going to be, uh, you know, firefighters and nurses and, and uh, you know, healthcare workers, I think we need to just be very careful and think, you know, very thoroughly through how we're implementing our, especially our high density affordable housing programs and what the impact on the local residents are, because I think, um, again, if, if my question is just how can we learn from previous experiences to make sure that, our residents are, uh, you know, are, are actually being considered when we're implementing these programs. Um, and um, I, I think just the second question I want to have is, is echoes actually the what the first um, uh, gentleman said, which is, you know, I, I have three kids, uh, young kids in the school district here, and um, hearing the stories of budget cuts that are being made uh, to the schools. And you know, it, it, just last night there was a developer who was talking about getting $2.5 million in TIF financing. And um, kind of similar to my first point, he, they were talking about using 20% of their units, about 18 units to house. They're actually talking about which types of convic convicted felons they would have in the units, whether it was, I think the example the developer used was a, whether they'd have someone who's a, uh, a, a convicted of fel felony embezzlement or whether it was five or six drug misdemeanors was the, uh, the words they used, uh, kind of weighing which one they'd have in their building. Um, so again, just want to think through kind of what are we prioritizing as a city? Um, so just, again, wanted to leave with those. Uh, the first one was the first statement was more of a question, but in the second is more of a statement, but just wanted to 
to share those thoughts and and echo the concerns of I think the you know the the first uh, caller. So thanks again for the, for taking the time. Thank you for that question. And those are questions that come up a lot. Um, first, I'd like to say that uh, rental housing and especially affordable housing, um, there is a tenant selection plan and background checks that are done on people that live in apartment buildings. I would like to say conversely, that doesn't happen when you buy a home. No one does have a criminal background check on you. So the, some could argue that rental housing is actually safer in some regards. Now, to some of the other points. With Amundsen, I can't speak fully to that. Some I know is rumor that is not based in fact, not all, not all, but some. Some has been um, exploded. I do get police calls um, reports every two weeks on um, the affordable housing and truthfully, uh, it's been pretty quiet aside from what happened recently it was pretty quiet. I'd also say that when projects opened during COVID, there was a um, eviction moratorium that was put in place. And the courts were not hearing anyone um, being able to be evicted. And then when COVID end ended and the eviction moratorium was lifted, the courts were backlogged. So even when there were residents in any apartment, that needed market rate or affordable, where eviction was going to happen, it was taking months to have that happen because the courts were so backlogged after a year and a half, almost two years of an eviction moratorium. And Amundsen Flats opened up right before COVID. And so there was some struggles in the beginning because of COVID, because of the eviction moratorium, because of the courts that was, um, that needed to be worked through. We're not in COVID anymore. The courts are catching up and tenants are being screened. Um, so with regards to serving people with um, disabilities or that have experienced um, homelessness, as I was indicating, we, the city, cannot support $30 million of gap financing for a development. We are dependent upon our, our funding partners. They have criteria. Minnesota Housing does, will only finance developments that serve folks that have experienced some homelessness. We are working we, with the developer last night. We had met with um, the police and the property management to try to get some systems in place early on. So that is something we're doing moving forward. I'd also say that the financing that was mentioned was TIF pooled money. It wasn't TIF. There's a difference. This money was from the Southdale area and it was collected over many years and it can only be used for affordable housing. I think the caller, uh, the caller did raise a good point, I think, around what have we learned? Yes, right? yes, and, for sure. And I think, um, you know, we haven't really been in this in this um, business in terms of affordable housing uh, for very long, at least for, for those of us that are with the city right now. And so the question about what did we learn, um, I think one of the things I have learned from Amundsen Flats and other projects is the importance of management of the buildings. Could you talk a little bit about uh, our relationship with the building managers and, and the kinds of discussions we have with them? Um, for sure. So we, when we became concerned during COVID that um, residents, nearby residents were concerned about the area, we started meeting with property management. And we have made a um, habit of doing that with all property management um, for all our um, new affordable projects. So we do try to develop that relationship. Um, like I said, we have a relationship with the police department as well. We are bringing the property management in early on. Once we hear about a project that is um, being considered, we want to bring the property management in early on to meet with the police department. And that's what we did with the project that was reviewed last night. And that was a new practice because as, like you said, we're learning. 
Um, and that's what, how we would want to do moving forward. Great, thanks. Jen, do we have any other callers? Operator, will you please unmute the line of our next caller? And as a reminder, caller, please begin by stating your full name and address for the record. Yes, my name is Lori Gerrits, 5513 Park Place. Um, the line to call tonight isn't a very good system. I've been disconnected three times. I don't know why. So perhaps uh, one of the questions I'm asking uh, might have already been answered. Uh, if the, uh, Ms. Hawkinson said, uh, was talking about the affordable housing is safe for the community and so forth. If it is so safe for the community, why are you getting police reports every two weeks from the affordable buildings? Uh, the other is how much so far has the city spent or dedicated towards affordable housing, <clears throat> and that would include things like TIF or pooled TIF funds or the affordable housing fund. And also there is a group that is meeting to, or has been meeting for over a year, looking at ways for raising funds for affordable housing. And you're on that group and Scott Neal is and James Pierce and formerly it was Ron Anderson, Jay Lindgren and our city attorney and it used to be the finance director. Question I have, what is the formal name of this group? And how much, you're still meeting, how much revenue are you looking to raise going forward in the future to be spending on affordable housing. Previously, you had looked at deed transfer tax and uh, a demo fee. So at that time, it was like $100 million for affordable housing. How much revenue are you curring, currently looking to raise on this? And uh, what sources are you currently looking at now? Thank you. Okay. Do you want to go back to the start of her, her one of her questions was, oh, why do we get if there's calls? no problems going on with affordable housing, why do you get pre press releases on it on a regular basis? Um, press release, excuse me, police reports. Yes, thank you. I, I get police um, reports every two weeks because of um, resident concerns. Um, the Edina residents are concerned about the affordable housing and there are some, um, you know, to put to rest some fears or to, or to look into some concerns that may be raised. Uh, so we get the police calls just to keep an eye to make sure that there's nothing untoward going on because there's so much concern that there will be um, behavior going on that that's why we get the calls. It's uh, preemptive. Um, do you want to answer the, the third question was around uh, the, the group that's been studying uh, kind of affordable housing, creation of a trust fund, sort of. Sort of. Um, that formal name of that group, I'm not sure it ever had a formal name. There's, it's ad hoc, <laughs> it's a project team. We didn't we, have a formal we, name. We have been calling it, I think, the affordable housing stakeholder group or something like that. No, it's a project team. A project team. Uh, we haven't met for quite some time now. Uh, I don't think there's anything really pushing us. One of the things that was interesting during that process was, or timely during that process was, if there was gonna be anything that required uh, the state legislature's attention, it needed to follow uh, a, a time frame and get adopted by the council, et cetera. The council decided there wasn't anything they were gonna push uh, out of that works, out of that group's work. So uh, I, it hasn't met in quite a while and I don't know if it's got a meeting coming up. So that's what I would say, it's kind of in a, um, a stall right now. And the middle question I... And how much were we planning on raising? The whole process has been stalled. Hypotheticals. Um, we were looking at, based on the goal of 1,804 new affordable units, we were thinking, okay, that's, what if we did half of that? In order to do half of that, we needed $100 million. And the whole process is stalled now. 
so we there's no how about the question she had about could you estimate how much we have spent on affordable housing in the you last know, five years? Say? I cannot do a, a fair job of okay. making an estimate. That is a question that I'm more than happy to answer on Better Together. I can look through that spreadsheets good. that I have, um, but I don't want to wager a guess. Yeah, good, thanks. Jen? We have no other callers at this time, um, so I think it's safe for you to wrap up and explain the online process. Uh, that's all for t tonight. As a reminder, you can continue to ask questions and make comments about affordable housing online at our bettertogether.org, uh, bettertogetheredina.org for the next week. The online conversation closes on Thursday, February 29th. Join us uh, for our next town talk on March 28th when we will talk about elections. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good night. Thank you.